Welcome to the Writer Groupie Podcast. I'm Kim Smith, the writing guru, bringing you discussions, insights, and insider details on planning, producing, promoting, and profiting as a writer. This is a podcast by writers for writers. You can find out more about Writer Groupie at www.kimsmithauthor.com. And here's the next episode of Writer Groupie. And here we are back to another episode of Writer Groupie. I think this is episode 39, you guys, in just about 13 episodes. We're going to be celebrating a one-year anniversary of podcast. Yay! I'm so excited. And tonight, my guest is Janie Franz. Janie's an old friend of mine. Janie was on my show way back when in the Introducing Writer days. And she was coming on at that time with the first book in the Boat Answer saga. And now she's got the whole thing complete, I think. Hey, Janie, come on, tell us pretty about much, it. Pretty much, pretty um, much. There may be three more. <laughs> there are oh. six in the series. And um, I will show this if we can. This is the the very first one, except yeah. these are new covers. They're beautiful. With a new per- a publisher. And um, they're, they're divided up into the Bow Dancer Saga and the Lost Song Trilogy. And I'll talk about that when yes. we get Yes. Oh, well, listen, we're so excited to have you back on the show. And I'm all excited for my my new listeners. There's like I, there's a ton of them that I'm sure are not familiar with the bad old days whenever we visited before. So please tell us all about your writing journey because they don't know and they want to hear about it. Well, what was interesting, um, five years ago, I um, actually was almost... Yeah, it'll be. <laughs> it's a long time. I published the the Bow Dancer, which was the first book in the Bow Dancer saga, and I had that uh, picked up by uh, Breathless P- Press out of Canada. And um, right soon after that, they wanted more, and it was a very short novelette. And actually, it's sort of a prequel for the rest of it. Um, then I wrote The Wayfarer's Road. Oh, that's over my face. There you go. Wayfarer's Road. Hold uh, it up just a little bit so we can see the rest of the cover. We see the title. Wow, very nice. Love that. And um, this is the third book. What are you doing? Yay. Yeah. Really like those covers. Those are fabulous. I, I had those done, reissued with um, Musida Publishing in the last couple of years. Um, right after I had Warrior Women published, I wrote a book about, well, I thought it was going to be one book, it ended up being three, about the origins of the women on the mountain in Warrior Women. And it's called the Lost Song Trilogy because um, my main character, Janelle, who is the bow dancer. She's a healer uh, in her little village and she came out of her village and is through circumstances not her own to discover the wide world. And so I wrote this book that I thought was going to be The Lost Song and I presented it to um, Breathless Press and I was working with their acquisition editor and they wanted me to gut it to and add more uh, romantic scenes and I said no can't do that and as soon as I did they said to me good find yourself a good chiclet publisher <laughs> well I didn't exactly find a chiclet publisher um, at that time I was in uh, negotiations with um, uh, Leah Shazaz with um, uh, Breath um, Music up publishing also in Canada. And I had uh, a track record with Leah because she used to produce the on the Music Up Online Writers Conference. I that remember. Was and it was absolutely phenomenal because you could actually chat with real authors and, and it was a lot of um, forum type things where you could just contribute and there would be Assignments and, and it's real workshops and I did a workshop for Music Up Publishing's uh, online writers group uh, one year for Mystery when uh, my Shannon Wallace series was first published. 
It was amazing it what, was. Did, what she was able to do. And that was the reason I got published the first time. Um, Leia had um, put out, was the first time she was going to have online pitches. And she had trained us on how to do these, you know, 40 second pitches and, you know, what we had to do, blah, 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 everything. But I didn't have anything long enough. And she went back and said, I really need to have some participants. Do you have anything? Go back and check the links. So I went back and looked, and I pitched too. And um, the boat answer was picked up. Uh, a short little creepy story called The Neighbor was picked up by somebody else, and they eventually, that house uh, was beginning to close. So I pulled it from there, and it is now published by Muse It Up. So when Leia approached us to, um, you know, she said, I have this idea. I'm going to start my own publishing house. Wow. And she had done so much research. I had such respect for her. She has always been above board. And I, I tell people, this publishing house is so unique because she will come up with ideas and she'll toss it to us, the house writers. And she'll say, what do you think? And we'll give her feedback here and there, right and left, whatever. And is it a good, good idea? Is it not a good idea? What do you see wrong with it? And then she'll come back and make a decision one way or the other based on our feedback. So we're kind of like a gigantic board of directors that That's works with fabulous. her. That's fabulous. That's fabulous. It's an amazing model. And so it currently is a digital publishing house. There are some, some print books out. Some of mine are going in print next year. Um, we're working out to do that. I just have to figure out which ones, and they have to be a certain length. So we may end up combining a couple of things, like the boat answer is too small, but the Wayfarer's Road is big enough to be print, printed. So maybe we'll combine both of those together in one book. Um, and it wouldn't be a very big book, so that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyhow, along with some other things I presented for her, I actually had um, one book of an... They're now two, and I'm working on the third. What I call my archaeology romance thriller series. Wow. Uh, Indiana it, Jones meets. Uh, uh, this is Discovery. Ooh, I like the cover. Nice. Yes. And Artifacts came up next. Like and it. Like so it. I'm working on Legacy right now. And it's about a, a young archaeologist and. Um, who actually has an involvement with a, a man who is um, half Hispanic and half Native, which I find very common here in, in New Mexico, but I had never been to New Mexico. Um, I wrote these about starting out in Arizona, but anyway, um, I've been researching the last one because I needed to find out about horses because that was part of... Um, what we did. So among that, um, we we then did. V Muse decided they wanted the law song, but they wanted it in three books as a trilogy, and we did verses, refrain, and coda. And I'm a pantser. If your readers know what that is, that means I don't outline. I'll have an idea. I'll put some notes down below the last paragraph I've written. Uh, it might be some research notes or whatever, or it's a um, talk about so-and-so next, um, that kind of thing. But the characters take over and do things. And I learned through Warrior Women not to push it. I had the pivotal scene I wanted to write. And I thought, I can't wait to write this. I want to write it now. And a lot of people do. By the time I got to that in the book, it had so drastically changed. It was the same scene, <laughs> but the energy within it was very different. The focus was very different. And so I liken this like that um, people who outline are like um, filming a movie. Yeah. They'll write all that out, and they can write scenes out of order because, and it works. Right? A pantser is like doing live theater. Yeah. 
you have to get that moment, momentum going. And if it doesn't, you know, work, you have to go back and read it, what you've written before, and try to find it where it went wrong, and then keep going from there. Because, Sometimes you have to ad lib too. <laughs> gosh, yes, yeah. Exactly. So it's been interesting. I've got, um, I have a couple of contemporaries. Um, one is about Hollywood. It's about an author who gets her her book optioned, and she's going to the premiere, and it's called the premiere. Uh -huh. And then I have this one. If I can do it this way. Sugar yeah. Magnolia. Ooh, it's got musical notes on it. What's that one about? This is the one about the, mu uh, the music industry. Oh, fun. Um, I had written three quarters of a draft probably 30 or 40 years ago. Could never make it work. <laughs> I pulled it out of a drawer after doing a lot of freelance journalism and doing a lot of music journalism. And when it was all handwritten, so I had to, you know, type it into the computer. And as I was doing it, it's like, hey, wait, we can add this and this and this and this. And suddenly I'm name dropping and talking about people that I've interviewed, some quotes I've I've actually said about people I've interviewed, and I created um, this um, classic rock band that was coming back, mm. for a comeback. and um, there's old blues men in it, and some of the characters are just crazy and nutty. But the interesting thing about that, my publisher is very, very, very particular about using um, real locations and using brand names and if you use personalities you have to have permission. Well there was, um, there were two people that I put in this book. Um, one of them was a friend of mine actually who is a hip-hop artist out of San Diego. Um, he, he performs under the name Deploy but his real name is Joey Lopez, and he spent a lot of time in Minnesota playing with a band uh, out of Minneapolis called Down Low. He does not do gangster rap at all. It's all about respecting your mother, respecting your 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 girlfriend. Um, it wonderful stuff, and he's just a, a charming human being. So I sent him pages, the manuscript with page numbers, and I said, Joey, can I put you in this? And he said, absolutely. He said, you can put me in anything you want to. Aww. And how did he put it? I like the light in which you paint me. Aw. Well, that's and a great went, verse. <laughs> uh, yeah, no wonder he's a hip-hop artist. Yeah. The other one, I had to go through this um, music icon's uh, manager. And I said, I will have to rewrite this. And, um, but if I don't get permission... And all I want is yay or nay. Can I put him in the book? I waited two weeks. I heard nothing. I wrote okay. back and I said, again, can I put him in the book? Here are the page numbers. Here's the draft so far. And they wrote back and said, good luck with your book. Ah. <laughs> and I said, wow. So I put Dr. John in the book. Awesome. And I... I've tried not to exploit that, but then I thought, my God, you're doing him a dis disservice by not saying, hey, go, di go get to see uh, the cameo of Dr. John in my book. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, it might bring uh, a whole new fans that sure. never heard of him. Exactly. Um, I mean, my gosh, he was popular way back when. A lot of people might not have heard of absolutely. him. Absolutely. And he was just on um, an NCIS New Orleans episode, the first one. Oh, I didn't get to see it. Too it bad. A Darn. It was the very last little thing that was on the first episode this time. Oh, wow. Um, when I had the first three books out, I had book trailers made. And, of course, now I have to have new ones. And for those, I had worked with a uh, two musicians out of Minneapolis. And um, uh, Chris O'Brien was with a... Um, and I'm trying to remember the... It's something to do with an elephant. Gosh, why can't I remember it? Anyhow, it's a famous quote by um, a philosopher. And so um, 
I asked Chris when he was playing in, in North Dakota at a, at a friend's bar, and I said, would you, do you have a piece of music? Would you be willing to write something for this? And he said, I've got something. I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> and so he said, let me send it to you. He said, I don't even have a name for it. And when I heard it, it was exactly what I wanted. Oh, wow. We named it Meadowsweet, which is one of the herbs that the bow dancer finds along the road. Um, he worked with another musician out of another band, uh, and um, something, the Traveling Gypsies or something like that. And this guy is a, um, Chris is a guitarist and singer-songwriter. Uh, the other gentleman, young man, is, uh, he plays an electric cello. Oh, so he was doing cellos? five or six. I didn't know they even had such a thing. Yes, he was doing five or six different little parts that they end up mixing into this thing. And then Chris did the second one. We did that for the first two books. And then for the Warrior Women, he wrote something totally different for it. So I still have those pieces of, of um, music. And I've got a friend in uh, who's a great gra graphic designer in Fargo who will put these together for me. So next year we'll be coming out with, with new book trailers and a brand new book trailer for um, uh, Sugar Magnolia. And um, we hope to be doing something with the Ruin series when the third book comes out. Hopefully I can get that written in the, before the end of the year. Um, and it's been a good thing that I let it kind of incubate. Um, while I was doing all of this research on horses, because it takes place on a horse ranch, I, things began to change within the story. Huh. Uh, I've got 60 pages of the book written, and I have no clue what's going to happen. <laughs> but it's one of those things. When you get into a book, um, you go into a zone, and especially if you're writing four, five, six hours a day, you get into a zone and even if you're up going to the grocery store, it's still playing in the back of your mind. It is. Like a soundtrack. And you'll be thinking of new things. And you yep. can't wait to get back to your computer. So, um, you know, I had come back. I'd had a new spark uh, this summer. I was at an event south of Santa Fe where I live uh, called the Day of the Cowboy. And I actually went to go observe women and how they sat a horse. Huh. And their, my character, I wanted to be very comfortable with the horse. And I saw two women that one of them was very ramrod straight with a fancy hat and, a, you know, everything. And she was an experienced rider. Uh, in fact, I found out she and her husband work a ranch uh, south of Albuquerque and that on horse they on horseback they don't use any trucks or anything the other woman works a ranch uh, near Santa Rosa by herself uh, she does use her trucks here and there but I saw the way she sat in a saddle it was like it was part of her hmm. she was very comfortable and moved the horse you know just with her knees more than anything else and I went oh my gosh that's exactly what I wanted to see so I had all these new ideas and another part of the ranch map, kind of, unfolded in my brain. <laughs> and I went, oh, we can do this. And recently, I went up to Taos because a friend of mine was kind of overseeing um, about six feral horses. Now, they were domesticated and let loose, and they're probably not rideable right now because of some health reasons with each of them. But one of them had horse hooves that had grown out probably that long and curled up like elf shoes. Oh my gosh. So she was trying to get local farriers and they said, fair, heard the word feral wouldn't go up. Oh. So I knew uh, a farrier uh, outside of Santa Fe who travels all across the state. And he's a big guy, so I knew no matter what he could do, he could handle this. So I called him up and I said, Alexander, do you want to, um, you know, uh, take on this job? And he said, might be a battle, but we'll do it. And uh, came up there and the horse was so gentle. Um, and he was able to 
take care of her and everything. But when I saw him work and his face, he's got this gorgeous face. <laughs> and I said to myself, he's going to be in the book. Of course. I, <laughs> that work's got to be in the book. And then when we were driving back um, to Santa Fe, he said to me, hey, have you ever done a romance with a farrier? <laughs> no. I said, I'll have to see if there are any out there. And he said, I've looked. There's none. <laughs> They're always with the laird, you know, the lord of the man That's or whatever. Funny. Never with the stable guy or the blacksmith. And I thought, why not? He said, I can tell you what I like, what kind of women I like. I said, well, let me think. i got to get a story around that. I can't just yeah. string it together with these, these scenes that you want me to put in there. i got to ask you, since you've been talking about uh, – Gosh, you've got so many, a number of books out, and, you know, you're in the process of writing another book. My question is, do you have a specific method that you get a book written? You know, I keep hearing more and more from people about um, how to sit down, take a no-nonsense approach, and get word count out every day. 3,000 words, 4,000 words, 10,000 words, whatever it is, a day. And I'm like, I'm feeling, because I'm something of a pantser also, and I'm feeling pressured, like I'm not fast enough. And you sound like you've done real well over the last five years turning out these books. I'm just curious to know if you have some sort of method that you use. Well, actually, um, I wrote most of them in a year. Uh, that's a lot of books in a year. I have 11 titles now. Mm. Um, but I was working through something uh, in my personal life. Uh, my marriage was falling apart. And so I delved into these books. This became a focus. Um, it was almost cathartic. Yes, very much so. Um, and I could produce. Um, now, when I was a freelance journalist, I used to keep um, a production calendar as well as a planning calendar. My planning calendar was something that, you know, here's what I'm going to do today. And thank God it's on the computer because you can move it for the sure. next when you know you're not going to get to it. But when I was doing that, I would put how many words I wrote that day. And some days I thought, you know, or marketing or whatever. I'm just not doing well at all. And I'd look back and I'd move my stuff into the production calendar and realize, yes, I have. You know, even if you only did 100 words, which is mighty small. But, I mean, usually I would write anywhere between um, 1,000 and 2,000 words a day, which isn't a lot. especially five when, pages. Yeah. Six, seven pages, maybe. No, probably a chapter, you know, a short digital book chap chapter. Um and then some days it would be, you know, much longer. Um, but you're working out ideas. Um, I do think that if you approach it as a business like I used to with freelance writing, um, have a certain time of day, you know, here since I'm retired and, you know, there's a dance I want to go to. <laughs> or I've got pet sitting for somebody that I'm doing. Uh, or I, I should really go check out and my my new passion here. Um, I just got connected with the local uh, New Mexico Archaeological Society. Oh. And I'm going to get involved with what they call Site Watch, which is uh, they assign you, after training, assign you a site to go and make sure it's not disturbed, nobody's vandalizing it and that sort of thing. And they have a lot of training opportunities. And I was talking with an archeologist and she said, oh, you should go back for your master's. And I said, I'm 66 years old. What so? am I gonna, what are <laughs> you can, do, do you can still do that? <laughs> yeah, but I said, I would like to teach. That would be interesting. She said, but I said, cost prohibitive. Oh yeah, and no, she I said, have to agree with that. Look, she said, why don't you try this? There's a lot of uh, opportunities to learn. Um, it, it may help you kind of not worry so much not, about not getting the degree until you're ready. Sure. But I have a friend who got her Ph.D. at 69, and she went up to Alaska and did her work. 
I have no problem with that. Yeah, but but see, the thing is, when you've got a variety of interests, it makes that writing time smaller. And lately, I've been spending a lot more time dealing with uh, networking and blogging, uh, hosting other people on my blogs, doing reviews of other people's books. Um, this is interesting for all of you budding writers out there, though. I get approached by... Um, you know, high-end uh, book publishing companies, uh, their publicists coming to me saying, we want you to host X on, on your blog for this blog tour. And I'm looking around at them kind of scant, you know, slant-eyed going, hmm, we were doing that five years ago. We were doing yeah. book trailers five years ago. Now you've got Patterson doing book trailers on television. You've got everybody and their grandmother doing this same kind of thing. Yeah. They're finding out that independent or small press writers are finding ways to get the word out that the brick and mortar ones are saying, look, we want to know that too. Yeah. So I'm reviewing... Um, New York Times best-selling Harlequin writers, and I'm going, I don't write, read that. Yeah. But if their readers want to come to my blog, oh, you bet. Please, oh, yeah. You know, please. Yeah, I have to say, that's, you know, that's one of my biggest things for having my podcast. Of course, it's because I love doing it. I've been doing it since forever. You know that. And mm -hmm. I really enjoy doing it. And I went without it for a very long time. And I missed it. I really, truly did. So that's why I started it back up. But it's also a great means of communicating with a new audience. Oh, absolutely. You know? There's people out there who don't go read blog posts, but they'll go to YouTube yes. and look at videos. Yes, and they'll go to a blog post and they'll listen to audio podcasts. There's well, yeah. just different ways that people like to consume their content. Well, when I did the book trailers the first time um, for that next year, I was, you know, putting those out on musician sites because I said, listen to what this musician has done. Mm -hmm. This may be something you might want to get into right. uh, on a, as a side note. No, granted, uh, my work with these people was in exchange for past work I had done to promote their bands. Yeah. Um, and they liked me, you know, they liked me. Yeah. So um, I think that was one of the things that I found out about um, Imaginarium, the uh, convention in Kentucky that where you and I actually got to meet. Face, face to face. face. You, well, yes, we did. Yeah, I was so excited about what people did and I found out that there were people there who still did blog hops and blog tours and I was getting a little disenchanted with that but they, they're saying no we can get 30, 40, 100 people to come on our you know pass by our blogs because they they do the Google Analytics and find out who, how many people have been there and I said so they're still viable yeah, you got to get with well, the Well, this right is news to me that. because everything that I've heard was that blog posts, you know, blog tours, that was just dead. I mean, nobody goes and reads blogs anymore. They go to Facebook. If you wanted to really capture an audience, buy Facebook ads. So this is really news to me. Well, that's what I heard. And they said, but don't talk about your book. <laughs> it's the other <laughs> thing. No, don't. They said, come and entertain us. And so um, if you've got a, a silly video you want to put on somebody's blog, come and entertain oh, us. Oh, my gosh. And so I thought, now I've been hearing about um, even somebody's blog, you should be talking about things other than buy my book. And I think, um, you know, just today, today we were talking about farriers. We we're talking about um, the, the uh, site watch uh, program. Uh, we're talking about archaeology. Uh, we're talking about good food in New Mexico earlier. <laughs> um, there's there's things that people need to know about us as authors that we're not um, a snooty bunch. Yeah. And I think one of the things I learned and why I really wanted to go to Imaginarium was the very first sci-fi convention, a uh, fantasy convention I went to was in Fargo, North Dakota. 
and it was probably early 90s, okay? And um, Margaret Weiss was there. She wrote the first Dragonlance books. These were based on a game that was like Dungeons and Dragons. Right. And she was all over the place. She was the keynote speaker, but she was all over the place. She would sit down with people. Oh, hi, how are you doing? You left the convention. Have you seen, did you see that costume? Have you, and just was human. And I went, oh my God, that's Margaret Weiss. Yeah. Oh my God. And so I thought, you have to go and be human. You do. And go where the fans are. That's and true. And the fans happen to be at cons, at they conventions, do. not right. writers' conferences where we may still be talking about the same thing in the panels. That's You're talking true. about, you know, how you plan your day, how you market, where you got your ideas. But then we're also, you know, there's been some crazy ones like, well, is it vampires or zombies? <laughs> <laughs> We did have an awful lot of fun at Imaginarium. It was my great pleasure to meet you, and I'm really, really glad you came on the show. I've just enjoyed this thoroughly. We are down to the last few minutes of the show already, believe it or not, and I want to give you the opportunity to promote to the listeners and the viewers who come to Writer Group, especially to meet new authors. So the floor is yours. You can find out all about my books at museituppublishing.com. If you go to the top of the page and hit authors, a uh, menu will come down and you find me, Janie Franz, under F. Click on that and you'll have excerpts and everything of all my books. Now the reason I promote that, now I'm on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, about any other, Kobo, any other site that you can find digital books, but if you go to Muse It Up for the same price, that you will pay someplace else, you can get every format in one purchase. For instance, oh, if you nice. have a Kindle, but you have an iPad, and you want to take your iPad on the, tr the plane with you because it's got a bigger screen, and you've got your movies on there too, you can get EPUB to put on there. Wow. Uh, yeah, we've got everything. Um, and next year, I'm hoping to have uh, some of the Bow Dancer Saga in print, and we will have that available for people who, even though I've got digital books and I review, and I have a nook, it's, I like the feel of a book in my hands. You know, I do too. I think everybody does, but that's fabulous. Janie, and I'm so excited that you came on my show again. You can come back. I would love to have you come back anytime. Well, we hopefully when we get this new book written and we, you know, have an inkling of when it might be out, I will be back. Call yeah. me or, or Facebook me, message me, some email me, whatever, and I let me know. I mean, 2016, I've already started booking in January, but 2016 so far, aside from a few dates in January, is completely clean. So We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> I'm excited for you. I'm so happy to got a, to get a chance to meet you face to face at the con and then have you on my show. I'm just blessed. I'm so grateful that you actually agreed to do this. <laughs> oh, it's been my pleasure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, you know, I'm going to cut us loose and I will just talk to you online very soon. And I want all my readers and all my followers to go out and find Janie Franz's Bow Dancer Saga. Y'all go look Absolutely. for it. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to this edition of Writer Groupie. For booking information, show notes, and more, visit kimsmithauthor.com.